So now we're going to bring the Network of Networks panel to the stage. And this Network of Networks work, if uh, you guys want to come and take your chairs, uh, started because we had a number of companies that were struggling with this term visibility. And even though everyone uses a different definition of digital, every company uses a different definition of visibility. So on my panel today is Ralph from BSF. Uh, I feel very fortunate that Ralph crossed the pond to be with us. Ralph has been very steeped in B2B processes at BSF for many, many years. He may tell you uh, as long as he's been married, but I'll let him have that discussion. And Heidi, who works for N4, uh, GT Nexus. And GT Nexus has been very active in the pilot work, and uh, we really appreciate that. And Brian, who was a big proponent of testing blockchain and uh, volunteered Snyder Electric Sandbox for us to do some work. So what is the goal of the Network of Networks effort? It was really to start a cross-industry networking group, and we have face-to-face -face meetings, and it was to start to develop some kind of compliance networks. And the reason why we started it was because today we don't have a way to really interoperate. We have more of enterprise-based systems and we're becoming more global, our relationships are more complex and dependent on our multi-party trading networks. And this is the definition that we came up with distributed and open and one of the things that we see in our work is that open technology is really, really critical to this work. And uh, we wanted to bring technology providers and business users together. And we've been working on this for about two years to really drive business outcomes. And we started with a definition and we had a session where I asked everyone to ideate about what could this be. And someone in the group said, well, you know, I want it to be like my cable box. I want to be able to interoperate any place and so we had a drawing and one of the things is that it's multi-party, many to many and often we think about visibility as one to many or one to one and then it would be multiple trading partners with source make and deliver capabilities and would operate on multi-tier canonicals that are well defined. It would have the ability for additional visibility and uh, we would get over the standards issues of mapping with ontologies and cognitive learning and really start to test with blockchain. So the other thing we did was we did some research to say where are we today on B2B and one of our biggest issues was trading partner onboarding. So we wanted to start there with some pilots. So let's start with our panel. Brian, why was this work important to you and Schneider? So at least from my perspective, um, I kind of live in a very unique place within Schneider Electric. I have the best job at Schneider Electric. I'm just going to get that out. Um, Ron may uh, question that, you know, or Ted. <laughs> so we can, uh, we can uh, deal with that over a beverage later, but um, I run the Center of Digital Innovation for Schneider Electric, and I'm basically the, the vanguard for open innovation. You know, we're 180 plus years old and we're one of the most technical businesses in the world. We have some of the best technical resources pretty much anywhere in our industry. And as a result, that's kind of created a concept within uh, our culture of if it wasn't invented here, then it's got a hurdle to get over as far as from an adoption standpoint. So, so my job is really to throw our doors open wide and evaluate technology from all over the world, bring it in, see if it's going to work for us and move it forward. Now, relative to the blockchain question, uh, I really think that there's maybe a handful of technologies that are really going to change the way that we all live in the next five to ten years. Uh, and this is one that, um, you know, there are some adoption concerns as far as the maturity of the technology, but it's important for businesses today not necessarily to just go to the airport and grab a magazine that has blockchain on the cover. I think you're going to walk away and really understand the possibilities within your business you need to make the investment and play with it you need to have frontline experience with it so that not only do you know what it can do it's good to understand what it can't do and we have many experiences i can tell you about where i've got both sides of the equation and it's part of our learning journey on any of our core technologies to really go at it from that perspective so i tease brian brian's a really smart guy and sometimes you know it's 
more complex, and I think I understand. Brian, how would you define blockchain to your mother? Uh, okay. So I think to, to really take it to the lowest level, the concept you need to wrap your head around is it, it's like a spreadsheet in the sky, right? It's a chronological, um, basically a register or recording of different events that have a couple of different characteristics than other systems. So, so one, uh, blockchain is what we call immutable, which means once it's in blockchain, you really had better be happy about it being there because you can never get it out. You can append to it or uh, add additional information to further define the, the prior record, but once it's there, it's there for life. So, uh, so hopefully you made good choices in that regard. Uh, it's also cryptographically secure. So the way that it actually manages the overall uh, dissemination of information and the security principles behind the model uh, make it by far one of the strongest places to store information. Uh, and then really it's distributed. So it's breaking down the barriers, it's disintermediating and also democratizing the concept of information storage. So, you know, a lot of the things that we do today go through central flow points. This really knocks those walls down and allows us to consider new concepts where everybody's an equal partner and we're redefining the concept of trust. Great. Heidi, why was it important for GT Nexus to be at the table? Because we worked a while to get you there and get you involved. So why was this important for you? Mm. Well, I wish we'd gotten involved sooner, um, certainly in the network of networks. GT Nexus is a network-based company, and we're all about network thinking and truly believe that the future does belong to network companies. I think we saw a slide earlier. It's a saying we always use. I mean, 80% of the data to run supply chains is outside any single enterprise. So you have to be connected to your networks. Um, and certainly once I started getting involved and really hearing what you're trying to do, I think it's important for our company. We're always looking for ways to make it easier for our customers to work with us, additional ways of value, and we understand that companies are going to be connected to multiple networks or their trading partners may be involved in networks. So it's important to us to understand, and in this forum that you've created that didn't exist before, to really talk with the customers, with the other network providers and say, you know, what else can we do to provide more value, make it easier for companies to join our networks uh, or inefficiencies? Um, one of the first, you know, pilot discussions that you had was onboarding. And fast time to value requires onboarding all your trading partners, your suppliers, your logistics providers. How do we make that easier? And if you have to do that on every network, I think that's an area that should be standardized and make it easy for everyone. Ralph, why was this important to you? Now, Ralph actually invited me to Germany, and he had a whole room of folks from Germany to have this discussion, and blockchain was all new to them, and, you know, the concept. Why was this important for you? Was this important to BSF for a simple reason? We started with EDI in the mid-90s when we started to connect our big customers, when we started to connect our big carriers on a point-to-point -point level through EDI, ANSI, or ADFACT. In the course, we learned that this is cumbersome and this is a process which you can only do with certain big customers. So we were looking for alternatives. We engaged in CAMI standards in the SIDEX standardization initiative. We engaged and owned networks amongst other chemical companies. So we, we were one of the owners of Alemica. We work with a small logistics hub in, in, in Germany, shortly out of uh, Ludwigshafen, Frankenthal, called Axit. So we were early starting to use networks. We didn't call them networks those days, but we were starting. So that was when we, when we started. And then the network of networks basically is the normal development in that direction. With one network, it's nice. So I had the job to try to tell the world how the beauty of one specific network is. And did I succeed? No, because our customers thought, BSF, go to hell. Our vendors said, BSF, go to hell. So we did not succeed. We did not have a chance to really make this one hub the hub. So the point is, as we do work with a lot of different businesses, a lot of different customers, logistics service providers across the world, we need to be able to interact with, with all of them. That brought us to the fact that 
our network has to be interoperable and to be able to interact, and that brought us to the network of networks. And one of, one, for me personally, one of the most reasons why I'm driving this is with the step to EDI, we took an important portion of the business away from the business. We make the critical and an IT action. We told the business, leave your hands away, you have no idea what you're talking. We need to bring this back to the business because we taught them EDI, electronic communication, is none of your concern, and it is part of the regular business. So we need to bring this back to business. So we need technology which is speaking a business language, and obviously blockchain goes into that direction. So that's why me personally and why BSF is involving in the network of networks. So it's really hard to get this group together because of that really big gap between IT and business that's grown over the last decade as people that are really steeped in e-commerce are over here and the business guys don't know how to talk to the e-commerce guys. And so my goal is to bring people to the table to transform B2B because I think one of the issues on the third industrial revolution that uh, Mr. Gordon was talking about this morning is we never took the concepts of B2C to B2B and I think that we were pretty naive about it and so what I want to do is bring the right people to the table, the standards bodies, the United Nations, all industries and really talk about how do we transform value networks. Brian, what's your goal? What are you hoping we learn from this work for the industry? So lots of things. I think that um, you know this is one of those technologies that two years ago a handful of geeks knew about. <coughs> now you can't walk through a new stand in an airport without being able to grab three magazines with it having some sort of prominent real estate on a cover. So it's becoming part of common vernacular. There's an awful lot of buzz around it. However, uh, to most traditional businesses, it's still very arcane. It's still science fiction. So the things that I'm looking to do here are to demystify, uh, demonstrate some functioning, practical things that can leverage these different types of technologies and really make the promise real. Uh, but beyond that, too, is I'm hoping that we start to challenge some of the status quo as far as the concepts of interoperability. Uh, we have a, a kind of a pandemic within our businesses where we consider uh, large software providers as the, the really the beginning and the end of transferring information to one another. And this really gives us an opportunity to think about new business models and new ways to communicate that, um, you know, uh, feel bad for those guys because they're not going to be able to collect the toll on that road anymore. But I think that this is really to start to evolve the, the concept of communication and business. Heidi, why is it important for GT Nexus N4 to be involved in this and what are you hoping to accomplish? Yeah, no, <clears throat> for a number of things. I mean, I think, again, you know, we're talking about our customers and other networks and how do we drive more value. And I think, again, this forum is very interesting, getting together companies and the different technology providers to together come up with, we may come up with next generation solutions that we weren't going to come up with on our own. Um, and I think a lot of the work, we've been testing out new technologies like blockchain and, and discovering what its capabilities and limitations are, right? So demystifying some of that has been interesting as well. And I think, you know, again, as all our customers are dealing with multiple networks and multiple technology providers, how do we make it easier for them? And even come up with, if you think about all the collective data and information we have, I think those insights we could get, we could come up with something we haven't even thought about yet. And that could be the next generation set of solutions through these network discussions. Yeah, I, you know, we don't know how to share demand data really effectively, right? Mm -hmm. And supply chain finance could take on a whole different dimension, right, with what we're talking about. And visibility could just totally be redefined. Ralph, your thoughts? Why, what are you hoping that we learn? What I hope is, first of all, that we learn to work in ecosystems. You heard this during the course of the last two days in every second presentation, ecosystem, ecosystem. But what is that? How do we do that? We, we Dow, BSF, we are competitors. How can we work jointly in an ecosystem? The point is, gathering the data is not the com competitive advantage. But what I, what I do with the data, how I read them, how I do draw my consequences out. So my entrepreneurial action, that is my competitive advantage. And that means 
We can work in an ecosystem to be able to capture more data. How I read them is something I do internally, and that is then my, my, uh, my value I drive out of this. And that's what something I'm driving, because as BSF, we are not targeting on one industry. We have automotive industry, semiconductor industry, agricultural industry, construction industry. There is no industry that we are not serving. So, right. So, the folks on the stage are very characteristics of the network network goals, right? I wanted product managers, not salespeople from technology, and I was able to get people like Heidi. I wanted people who cared in their DNA about e-commerce, and I got Ralph. And I wanted innovation leaders like Brian. And so as you think about the network of networks and you think about, you know, could you join this group? It's open to everyone. Uh, we don't want lots of people at the table. We want 25 to 30 people. Uh, we meet four times a year and we do monthly calls. And there's also a technology subgroup that's forming to look at interoperability amongst current networks to evaluate blockchain kind of capabilities and demystify it. And we're also working on business to business case studies because one of the issues is we are not aligned on B2B and we're not aligned on what is the ROI of B2B. So what questions do you have for the panel? Pass the mics. Yes. It's interesting with the conversation around blockchain given that there's a proliferation of different standards and types of blockchains and hundreds of startups, uh, how do you create a network of networks when each of the network members has a different variation of blockchain? Brian, you want to take that? So this, we, we kind of stand at uh, the point of development <coughs> of this technology where it's kind of like the old folks in the room like me remember when oh, you could go into a video store, uh, that's right kids, there was a place where you went and you rented a movie uh, that you had to rewind before you brought it back. Uh, but um, you, there was a point where you walked in and there were two types of cassettes on the, on the wall. And depending on which one you chose, it really kind of dictated what sort of architecture you had at home to enjoy home entertainment. Uh, right now there, there are multiple competing standards, completely agree. The good news is, is that for the most part, the distributions of the blockchain mechanisms as far as the individual packages, uh, most of them are underpinned by open source code that live against relatively similar frameworks. So they're going to be cross compatible. Uh, the individual flavors of the distributions is something that they're going to probably fight out for another year to two years. Uh, and, you know, the way that we're making sure that we stay interoperable is really to make sure that, you know, the blockchain, don't think of it as anything more uh, complex as a relational database in your current architectures, right? It's not only about the channel, it's about how you get stuff in and out of it. And as long as you make the appropriate IT decisions and architecture decisions, you're wired for future expansion and it can kind of mitigate some of the concerns and, and you know I know that a lot of people in the room and a lot of people within my business too are like you know should I use Hyperledger, should I use this one, how do you make a decision and it dissuades a lot of people from getting involved in this particular functional technology because it's so fluid. I say get involved because it's so fluid. Right now you have an opportunity, everybody in the room could get started developing in this platform tomorrow. Uh, and through participation with some of the, the consortiums that actually lead the, standardiz the standardization, you can shape the future of this platform. You're, you're, you know, we stand right now at uh, what could potentially be the, the next internet. Uh, so I strongly recommend that you and your businesses grab the wheel and get in. So Heidi, I don't see the barrier as the multiple forms of blockchain. I see the barrier as we don't know what multi-tier processes should look like. What do you think? And what, you know, where the use cases and capabilities, I feel like I hear a lot of, you know, here's blockchain, come up with the use case, right? <laughs> Versus what is it good for? Right. Um, and certainly uh, it is, it has strengths in some things and it definitely has a long way to go. It's a newer technology and it depends on the use case. Um, and when I first heard with what we we're trying to do with the network of networks and coming up with a common place for onboarding, and since we're multiple networks and multiple parties, we didn't want to designate one as a central point, if you will, started looking at blockchain for that. 
that solution. Um, and it's been interesting with the concept of multi-tier or multi-party visibility, we're discovering that there are some limitations in the blockchains, right? The distributed ledger distributes everything, right? And some of the key things in networks that we've talked about is you want visibility and transparency, but with certain limitations, right? To certain parties or certain information. So I think that's, and to your point earlier, that's something we can help with this new technology and push that. But, you know, I think there's definitely, it's, it's a great um, tool uh, for scenarios, and we'll, and we'll definitely be using that as part of the solution, but we're finding the right fit for that. Yeah, the whole many-to-many, -many, I think we're still challenging yeah. the technology. Okay, other questions? Uh, we have a question over here. Jack? So, Jack Cromley, Tuskegee University. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that Tuskegee University is very interested in is uh, get into blockchain. So, so from, um, I think from a, from a high end, uh, we do have uh, BOT members that are that are uh, part of food food industry and very interested in doing blockchain. So, so uh, so looking forward to hopefully joining the network of networks and uh, having students interact because I, I think from a uh, from a talent perspective, uh, th there, there's a need for 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 students to understand and for faculty and academics to understand. So so uh, hopefully looking forward to engaging. Thank you. And hopefully people will network with Jack. I really believe in diversity in the supply chain, and I went to one of Jack's open houses for recruiting, and I contrasted it to some of the um, other uh, colleges that tend to be um, more what I call stale white bread. And, uh, you know, there were fewer people at Jack's university uh, for recruiting, and I really believe in diversity. So. Please get to know Jack, and uh, he's trying to do some things on blockchain for students. And if you've got technologies that you can help him out with, uh, he's all ears. So, okay, other questions? Any other questions for the group? So, if you had to sum this up in a couple words, Ralph, in terms of, you know, what do you think this means for 2030? What do you, how would you sum it up? I draw you my picture of 2030. In 2030, a customer calls and says the same as last year. And I have an artificial tool behind this which goes through my records and asks them, Did, do you mean uh, this or that because these two items you ordered last year? And then he says, now the first one and the artificial system places an order. Because I, I love to go back to the good old days. You'll realize that in my discussions. And what was wrong with calling a CSR? What we could not do, we could not afford to have hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of customer service people taking calls, but to have a virtual assistant which is connected to my system, which can give an answer and which can help to ease the process of placing an order with BSF. That is my dream. It must be easy for my business partners to work with BSF, to get information out of BSF, and that we are in a, in a sharing mode, that we are working in ecosystems, sharing as much as we can share and as we are supposed to share, because at the end of the day, okay, 2030, I want to get my pension from BSF, not my salary slip, but many others want to get their salaries and their bonuses, and this only happens if we remain to be a successful company. Okay. Heidi, how about yourself? For 2030, I mean, I think the concept of networks, I think we will truly see value chain orchestration, right? Everything will be connected end to end from, you know, origin to customer. Everything will be visible. You think about fulfillment, it's not just from warehouses and stores. It'll be anywhere from in the network because you'll know where your inventory is. It could be at a manufacturer, it could be in transit. Uh, it's really going to, you know, that on shelf time will improve. And I think it'll be more, instead of issuing kind of an order, it'll be automated in the network process, have visibility of what's on hand, the latest demand signal, and it'll be fulfilled. So I think because everything's connected, it'll be a lot more flexible. Brian? That's a big question. Um, you know, I think that there's a few things that kind of stand out. If I break it into two pieces, uh, we're talking a lot here about blockchain. I think that that's going to be very pervasive and it's going to redefine a lot of concepts that businesses really haven't thought about in the last hundred years or so. Things like ownership. 
Uh, it's going to remove friction from transactions and reduce the barriers to participation in value networks where your small mom and pop end users uh, will have the opportunity to opt in because the cost basis for open so software is next to nothing. So if we make the right choices, we can add additional value and speed to the network by using these technologies. So as far as the things that I see in 2030 uh, around uh, just the overall picture, is visibility no longer becoming a problem. Uh, reliance on large enterprise class software solutions is going to continue to diminish. You're going to see open source continue to eat the large software vendors uh, at, a, at a staggering rate. And I think that there are going to be new platforms that emerge from these business models that are really going to turn uh, the concept of information, custody of information, and things like intellectual property management completely upside down. Uh, so uh, I'd say buckle up, but uh, things are, things are going to get much more democratized and, uh, and a little bit more accessible. So you guys are all going to be at the reception if people have questions, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hoping that we learn how to disintermediate banking, you know, because I really do think that, you know, we need to change the world so the largest building in every city is not a bank and that we create more value for people and we make visibility really happen. So thank you very much to my panel.